Welcome to the Monsters Madness and Magic podcast. I'm Justin here with my co-host Jason, and we are joined by a very special guest today: actor, writer, producer, rap artist, man of many hats and many talents, Mr. Norman Golden II. Norman, how the hell are you this evening? I'm doing wonderful. How y'all doing? How well, the hell are you? <laughs> we're doing doing pretty damn good. <laughs> well, good to hear. Good to hear. So. You got started at a very early age, and you didn't just get started. You you hit the ground working with some legends. So just talk us through how you got started acting and how you landed working with the big boys. Well, um, man, you know, this is a story that I, I never <laughs> – it's like how do you start and where do you start? I mean, I guess I can start I – was, I was six when, you know, I guess the acting bug bit me. Um, I used to uh, watch, you know, TV with my folks as a family. Uh, we would watch the Cosby show, you know, it was a family show. So that was quite naturally something that, you know, we gravitated towards. Um, and, you know, I would see the Cosby kids, you know, doing their thing. And I was old enough to know that it wasn't like, that wasn't like real life, you know, but still like kind of, you know, inquisitive about what that was about. So, you know, I'd always tell my parents, you know, hey, I want to do like what those kids are doing. And, you know, of course, my parents were like, yeah, well, you know, when you get older, sure, you, you know, you can do anything. I mean, they never discouraged me, but they were just like, you know, sure, <laughs> mm -hmm. you can do it, but, you know, I don't know, like, how are you going to do that now? So, um, actually, after, you know, me saying that repetitively, um, my uh, mom, because I'm, you guys don't know, I'm a Nietzschean Buddhist. So, you know, we chant. Uh, so, um, you know, I was young at the time, so I didn't quite really understand what all of that meant. But my mom would say, well, you know, if that's what you want to do, you know, pray for it, chant for it. And so I'm like, okay, sure. So, you know, periodically, we you know, my family, we would pray and we would watch the show and watch TV. And I saw the shows as well. And I was, you know, praying and chanting and watching shows. And so long story short, my auntie, enrolled her uh, son in an acting workshop. And so she suggested that my mom do the same thing. And at first my mom was hesitant because she's like, I don't know, you know, like he's kind of young. My, my auntie was like, well, he's, you know, I mean, he's very precocious and he has that theatrical talent. So I think if nothing else you can, if he's been bugging you guys, cause my mom also, you know, mentioned side note that, that, you know, I've been bugging them about getting started right. um, in the industry or whatever. So, it just kind of, all this just kind of came after me, you know, repetitively doing that. So my mom and dad decided to give this acting workshop a try. Interesting thing though, at the time, my family lived in North Carolina and not in LA. My, my dad's job actually had, had transferred, we he got transferred to Charlotte. So mm -hmm. the acting workshops were in LA. However, I was able to attend the workshops because it was a two month workshop. Um, I was able to attend the workshop because my parents work, both my parents work for the airlines. So what I would do is every, the workshops were on Wednesday evening. So after, you know, after I was going to say work after school, <laughs> uh, my parents would pick me up and my mom and I would fly to LA and due to the times of difference, cause you know, Charlotte's three yeah. hours ahead of LA. So we would fly to LA. I um, had plenty of time to like get ready for the workshop. One of my mom's, uh, good friends would pick us up from the airport, drive us to Burbank. I would do the workshop and then she would drive us back um, to the airport. We would catch a red eye, fly to um, Charlotte, fly, you know, fly back home and then I would go to school. So we did this for two months. And so at the last class, my dad actually took off work and he flew, you know, we all flew out back out to LA to do like this talent showcase and at the talent showcase there were agents and managers and all that so there were three major agents that were there like kind of talent scouting and all three of them actually wanted to rep me after I did my showcase because I wrote a I wrote a PSA actually on reading so I performed that in front of all these people and they were like <laughs> we want this kid so uh, my parents are actually you know they got guidance on who would be the best uh, representation you know to go with and they did that and about so did all that and then went back to North Carolina and it was crickets for a good maybe six to eight months um, then my parent my parents were able to put in for transfer to come back to LA because that's actually where they really wanted to be to so put in the transfer 
came back and then I started auditioning on a regular basis. And at first I wasn't booking, you know, everything that, you know, I was auditioning. Actually, I wasn't booking anything. About three months passed, then I booked a couple of commercials and then I got a guest appearance on um, the show called True Colors, which is, you know, actually went off the air right before I booked Cop and a Half. And then I booked Cop and a Half and that was just kind of when everything started mm -hmm. to kind of happen. I can't tell you how cool it is that your parents were so supportive. You know, I, from the outside looking into the Hollywood industry, that just seems very rare. And yes. you, yeah. I can guarantee you most of the kids there were not traveling across the country to go to that class. So that's, that's just very impressive for someone so young to be that driven. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you know, when I tell the story, you know, a lot of people, they kind of, they're like, that sounds a little far-fetched. So you flew across the country for two months every Wednesday for <laughs> an, an acting workshop. And then you flew back home and went to school the next day. Yes, that actually happened. And you are absolutely right. I, you know, my parents are really, really, um, you know, they're, of course, they're near and dear. But like, they, I love them dearly. But, you know, I, I, I really, I often give them, you know, praise I cannot thank them enough because you know not only were they able to do that and you know make those sacrifices but even through you know the height of my career to you know when things weren't quite happening they were just they've always been very supportive parents and they're just they're just the coolest and I, I love them I can't even tell you how much <laughs> you know I love them and I, I, honestly it's not necessarily just because of that but just they're just good people Right. You know, to, to begin with, I mean, you, I mean, I guess you, know, you have to be in order to, to be willing to do that for a child, because I mean, I have other I have two other siblings as well. So, you know, that's that that was a lot on their plate. But I, I, I really appreciate them being able to, to you know, make those sacrifices. Kudos to mom and pop golden. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're kind of already on the subject anyway. My next question, uh, you have. A crazy humanitarian history work even you were visiting cancer patients with cop and a half and yeah. I, I was going to ask if that wasn't that kind of work ethic and generosity was something that was instilled uh, to you with your parents but yeah that's oh that's, yeah uh, I mean my, yeah my parents have incredible hearts you know generosity is you know obviously one you know key element that you know they've instilled in all all of us you know my siblings and I um but yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely, you know, they, you know, they all often said, you know, if you have a platform, you know, use it to help other people. I mean, and it, it may sound trite, but you know, it's, it's really true. Like, I mean, if we have an opportunity to help another individual, I mean, that's really what we're, what we're put here for. Cause at the end of the day, you know, outside of the trappings of fame and fortune and all of that, all we have is each other people. You know, that's like the highest currency that you could you could ever get. A lot of people is lost on that because, you know, we're trying to chase the next role or chase the next opportunity or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's the people who are connecting and making all this stuff happen. So if you don't care about people or you're just out for yourself, you know, that's it's a very inhumane way to live. You know what I mean? And it goes against just the very grain of who we are as people. Well said. So how did you start um, when you got that first gig as a kid? Do you remember how it felt when your parents told you, you know, that this is finally going to happen? I do, actually. Um, wow. You know, I actually haven't relived this in, in, a, in a while. But I was actually <laughs> at school. Um, and this is when I got, when I booked Cop and a Half. Because before Cop and a Half, I'd done, I you know, about four commercials. And then I did the TV, you know, the, the guest show, guest appearance on, on, um, True Colors. True Colors. And so I, I understood what it was like to book, you know, a gig, but something as big as Cop and a Half, I mean, I hadn't really understood that yet, you know? Um, so that school and, uh, my agents had called my parents earlier in the day to let them know that I, you know, I booked. And so when I got home, cause my sister would come and cause her school was like, you know, 
down the street from where I was. So my, one of my older sisters, she would, on her way walking home from school, she would pick me up and then we would walk home together. And so my sister, everybody, everyone knew except for me, obviously. Um, so I walked into the house and <laughs> they start singing the song, for he's a jolly good fellow. <laughs> and so I'm like, why? What, 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 what is going on? So, and they're like, you know, hugging me and, you know, like, yeah, hey, you did it. And I'm like, it's still not sinking in. I'm like, did what? And so finally, <laughs> my dad was like, cause he used to call me dude sometimes. He's like, you got it, dude. You got the part. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, the movie. And he was like, and they were like, yeah. Everybody like literally in unison was like, yeah, you got the movie. And I was like, what? And so of course I was all smiles and laughs and just was, over the top that's great so you just mentioned earlier that uh you were a buddhist i believe correct me if i'm wrong yes i did okay i saw an interview of yours in my research where you said I, it's a quote of yours i found very interesting you said you were speak you were speaking on life imitating art and you said folks don't understand or really comprehend the responsibility that comes with what we create and put into the world yes that's a very esoteric statement uh did uh do you think that's not my original question but since you said that earlier i'm shifting do you think your mantras as a kid had anything to do with you getting that job oh absolutely you know and it's and i don't mean to get too you know too do deep it in, but you know i i do believe that it, it was it was the, the mantra and also the energy behind that um when you you know when it us as human beings, you know, we have such capabilities and that, that is, you know, technology and the we I mean, the fact that we're talking right now and a lot of the things that we've seen created by this mind, you know, is, is incredible. So coupling that with the ability to, to just go out and do whatever, like if someone told you and you've heard, like for me, I was fortunate to hear all my life, you can do whatever you put your mind to. So that coupled with, you know, obviously, yes, the energetic, um, you know, chanting of the mantra, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, repetitively, that vibratory uh, energy definitely connects us to, you know, number one, our highest good and what we're supposed to be doing. I mean, obviously, you know, cop and a half is not, cop and a half and my, my acting career and everything that I've ever done is certainly a part of, you know, my, my life's trajectory. So by chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo or, you know, basically fusing my life with the rhythm of the universe, um, at an early age, I was able to manifest and show like what we, we, we call actual proof of, you know, that vibratory um, uh, commitment basically to us, you know, living out our mission. And, you know, it's, so I, you know, I, I would say chanting, is the the modality that I've that I've chosen that has worked for me, but it works the same, you know, with prayer. Whatever you're doing, you know, if you you are fusing yourself with that higher energy, miraculous things can happen. I mean, and we hear stories just you know even off of, you know, we call them miracles, but that, what it is is just once again us being really in in unison and in connection with our higher powers or or that 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 higher vibration. And for me, like I said, with chanting, because it is basically it's an audible medita uh, meditation because it's a mantra you chant over and over. Nam yo ringe kyo, nam yo ringe kyo. So it's the words in them in 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 of themselves have a meaning, and they have you know uh, the power based on the meaning we put behind it. But our intention is really where you know we can start to see the manifestation. Of right. things. I mean, you can you can say water, 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 water over and over, but if there is no like intention behind that, you're just saying the words, you know. Or you can say what water can be your man, your 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 uh, your uh, you say your mantra, but there is still a certain intention, I guess, you put behind whatever it is you do. If that, may, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, <laughs> having since you believed that young that that worked 
that the fact that it did work did work even in your sense even if if whether you believe it or not any listeners out there it worked yeah. it has to give validation to your beliefs at a very young age you know and just strength yeah, it. yeah. Especially, well I mean, I mean i certainly you know that was you know it was it was a very big benefit you know as a result of me you know chanting you know but that's not just a one-off situation. I mean, yes, right. I've chanted for my acting career and there are other things in my life that, you know, I've chanted to have manifest and they did. And there are things that I've chanted for and it didn't happen. And it's not because, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't use the same energy or I didn't do whatever, what I just explained. But, you know, once again, it's, it's about, you know, us being in rhythm with, the universe and and for me you know my you know with chanting nami harbin get kill it definitely keeps you know and and chanting nami harbin get kill and also pra the practice of buddhism nietzsche buddhism and and the study of you know what it means to be you know a bodhisattva of the earth or you know chanting these words um you know and practicing to be happy and also sharing it like i'm like i am with you all with other people right. um it just definitely it it does wonders for your life in terms of keeping you in rhythm. And even when you're out of rhythm and things aren't working the way that you think they should work, it's still for, towards your, your mission, you know, on this, on this, on this planet. I mean, we as Buddhists believe that, you know, creating value while we are here in this, you know, in this, this physical sense is really what it's about, you know, um, there's a, you know, a saying or a word that we call, we, we say, um, you know, doing Kozen Rufu, which basically is a spread of world peace, you know, and that's not necessarily like, meaning we go out in robes and we're like, oh, here's a flower <laughs> for peace. It's like, we do that based on, you know, our actions. For example, I'm talking to you all, you know, and you were inspired by my work right. 20, 30 years ago. You know, that, that in essence is, you know, me, doing Coles and Rufu because there was probably something in that movie that you all looked at and was like, wow, this is an inspiration. I want to do X, Y, Z with my life. You know, right. it inspired you in some way, shape or form. So that's a ramification of me, you know, wanting to become an actor. And then also, like I said, inspiring so many people over the years. A lot of links in the chain. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so cop and a half. When your first day on set, what's it like for you? How old were you? I actually, I was seven when I booked the part, but the first day of principal photography, I turned eight. All right, so eight-year-old Norman's on set. What what's still going on in your mind? What what kind of what's your senses telling you? Uh, <laughs> um. Wow, you know, it, it for me, it was just, you know, all the practice that I had, you know, going into those workshops, you know, you know, all the, the practice that I had, you know, with the, the little skits that I would come up with, with my uncles and, you know, family members and, you know, cousins and stuff. And, you know, just all the make believe, all the play that I had done, just kind of, like, it was kind of like, okay, this is, this is real. Like this, you are like on a movie set now. <laughs> and there were a few moments, you know, if I, cause I mean, it's been so long ago, but there were a few moments, you know, in my, in my frame of mind then, you know, where actually it was the first day is like, wow, okay, I'm, I'm here. And then, you know, maybe a month into the shoot, it's like, oh, wow. Like I'm actually still doing this, you know? And then I think, you know, when we wrapped, that was actually a very, difficult time for me because it was like okay so I did this but now what you know when we actually rap you know production right you know it's like okay so what what now like I I want to keep doing this can <laughs> I keep doing this and then you know obviously after that you know you have the the marketing push that I you know I had to you know I was in New York for back and forth in New York doing the interviews and whatnot and so there was all that time in between the actual production and then the premiere of the film and then when the premiere happened you know, it was like finally seeing what I had done, you know, for three months, you know, the, the year prior, because it can't, you know, we filmed in 92, it came out in 93. Finally seeing all that come to light, it was just like, 
wow, like this is, this is what this is all about. And I mean, obviously I was, I was hooked. I mean, that was what it, what it was about for me. Like, I, I was like, this is, this is it. Okay. This is all the, the, the dream that I have from, you know, watching the Cosby kids. Like I am now <laughs> one of them. <laughs> and it was, it was tripped out. You know, it was just like, you know, there was a lot of, there was an immense, even at that age, it was like an immense amount of gratitude and like, wow, I actually get a chance to do this. You know, it's gotta be a cool feeling. Um, oh, I yeah, it was, it was dope. In one of your other interviews, I saw that um, you weren't too familiar with Burt Reynolds' work going into Cop and a Half. So no. at what point in your life did you were you able to have that realization like, oh, shit, that was Burt Reynolds? I was eight years old working with, you know, one of the biggest legends in Hollywood history. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, honestly, because I, you know, Burt was such a, humble do you know um and this this may sound contradictory i mean he was very aware of his success and what he had done but he wasn't like you know he carried himself in a, in a confident like yes i am capable but i'm not like you know like yes i'm burke reynolds you know what i mean because actually <laughs> right. at the moment i worked with him <laughs> he had he had been he had gone through i mean burke's career overall had has been you know he'd gone through some things yeah. <laughs> so I think um, based on that and his the way that he he carried himself and he was with with me and my family, I just started kind of looking at him as kind of like a family member. Like, oh, okay, that's that's Bert. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, there were there were periods of time. I think when I you know was older, like into my, into my adult years, actually, to be honest with you, even past my teenagers, I finally like 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 wow, okay. I, I worked with Burt Reynolds. I mean, this guy for for five years straight, he was the number one box office draw. Like, I don't think anyone has, I mean, I don't know if anyone has actually done what he was able to accomplish, you know, at that time, even still, you know I mean? He was one of the most bankable actors in Hollywood, you know? And yeah. so, like you mentioned, that was, you know, I, I had a couple of moments in time where I'm like, wow, that was really, that was really something, you know, but again, it just, I, it boils down to, you know, being very grateful um, to have had that opportunity and, you know, humbled by it as well. I didn't know this until recently when I was actually like looking up stuff when, after we learned we'd be talking that uh, I did not, had no idea growing up that Henry Winkler directed that movie. Mm hmm and that's yeah. just another one on the list. So what were you doing with the Fonz? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Henry. <laughs> um, yeah, Henry was, I think, you know, because Henry had kids. So, you know, he, he had three children, young children at the time. And so, I mean, that was his first directorial um, film, you know, thing that he, you know, film that he directed. So there was a lot of learning, you know, for him on the set. I mean, he'd been in the industry, you know, he'd been working for, you know, he was the Fonz, he played the Fonz and he'd done a bunch of stuff, you know, uh, prior to Cop and a Half, but it was still, him and I were, um, I say all that to say that him and I, I think were kind of stepping into new realms, respectively. Like, I mean, he'd been in the industry, but he, he was new to directing. I was new to the industry and new to acting. So I think that was, we were learning a lot together. Um, and I mean, working with him was was very interesting. I mean, he, he gave me a lot of, uh, quite a bit of leeway to kind of just do, you know, like what I, you know, what I wanted to do, which I think was great for me. I mean, that's the greatest thing that, you know, directors can do with actors, just let them naturally, um, you know, let them naturally like do what they what they do. But then on the flip side to that, there were times when he was trying to direct me, and those are the times when Bert would ha would come in and say, "Don't direct him. He's a child. He has more, way more energy than you and I combined, <laughs> <laughs> and then some. So let this kid do what he." does naturally 
as long as he's hitting his mark and he's not screwing up the pages, which, you know, I knew the script from top to bottom before I even got to Florida to shoot. <laughs> Let the kid do what he, what he does. And so that kind of caused a little bit of conflict here and there between Bert and Henry, because Henry's like, well, you know, I'm the director. I need it. And, and, and Bert's like, well, I'm a director and I've directed more films than you've acted in. So <laughs> trust me when I say, let this kid do what he, what he's doing because it's brilliant. <laughs> and you don't feel the need to like, feel like you have to direct him because your job is already done for you. Be happy about that. So right. I say, I'd say it was, it was fun. It was interesting. You know, fortunately, I, because I was a kid too, I was shielded from a lot of the politics between Bert and Henry because there were. <laughs> you know, when, when oh he, man. The um, Fonz and the Bandit, and that's a fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, tell, I have to say, tell this one story. So we were, we were, I forget what shot it was or what scene it was. We were shooting and, I, you know, and it's Florida. It's in, in the summertime. And I was, you know, I, had, I think it, it was actually, yeah, it was one of the scenes where I had the jacket, the police jacket on. And so it was hot outside. It was 90 degrees with humidity. And if you've ever been, if you're from the South or you've been yeah. in the South, you know that weather, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm sweating, like just sweating crazy. Bert is too. And we're doing this scene. And <laughs> Henry says, cut. Right? He says, perfect. Yeah. One more time. So this is after maybe, I don't know, 13, 14 takes. <laughs> so Bert looks at me. He looks over at the crew and he's like, I don't think you can get any better than perfect. But let's go again, since he wants to. <laughs> so I'm <was> like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm looking, I'm thinking as a kid, I'm like, oh, we got to do this again. Oh, man. You know, so we reset and finally he, him, him, Bert and Henry, you know, they talk and then, you know, they're like going over and, you know, there's a lot of head bobbing and, you know, <laughs> gesticulating and finally, you know, Bert walks back to me and he's like, he does one of these salutes and Henry's like, all right, that's check the gate. Check the gate. <laughs> At the time, check the gate means, you know, that's the last, you know, last shot, check the you know, the gate to make sure there any, there's not any hair in the filter where the film was going through the, you know, the, the, uh, the lens or whatever. And then that's, you know, on to the next scene. Um, but yeah, there was just moments like that was, was, awful. you know, he's, yeah, perfect. Cut. Perfect. Okay. One more time. <laughs> but, I like how the rest of the crew is waiting on the word from Bert to actually do it though. <laughs> <laughs> and, Bert, the way, and the way he says, I mean, he's a, he's, he was a very funny guy, but you know, uh, like even when he was perturbed or like in that sense, he's just like, kind of like, dude, you know, I mean, like you can't get any better than perfect. Like, what, what are you looking for? <laughs> like, this kid is getting ready to pass out. He's got like all these layers of clothes on and it's hell temperature. What, what? Between you and Bert, were there any uh, were any of those scenes improvised or anything? Did it, any moments? Um. Yeah, actually, we we did quite a bit of improv. I mean, we stuck to the script, but we would, you know, every now and then, you know, we would we would dance around and, you know, try little things. Um, I, I and that's when I really had a lot of fun when we would do that. Um, actually, in the screen test which is one of the auditions that, the, the very last audition that I did before I actually booked. Um, that's actually where I met Burt Reynolds. We did, you know, we did the screen test together. So we did two scenes. And um, I think that in the screen test, we had more fun with just like ad-libbing and doing things. I mean, when I was on, like I said, when we were on a set, we kind of stuck to the script, you know, for the most part. But the screen test, uh, we were, you know, doing the scene, and I mean, at this point I had auditioned, this was my fourth, third or fourth um, audition. I'd done an original audition, then I had a call back. Um, and actually I was eliminated from the, you know, from the running. Cause they said I was too small to do like stunts and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the casting director was like, no, you guys got, this kid is, he's got chops. Like he's, he, 
you got to still see him, keep him in the runnings at least, you know? So mm -hmm. I was brought back in for a second callback and then the screen test was ordered where I think it was a hundred and from like a thousand or so kids, it was down to like 120. And um, a bunch of those kids were eliminated and it, it came down to six kids, two from LA. I was one of the ones from LA, two from like Chicago and then another two from New York. So we were in different cities, they flown, flown them in and all of that. Um, so I digress just a bit, but so at the screen test, um, you know, I, so by this time I had auditioned so much so I knew what the material was. So I was very, very like fluid in what was gonna happen, which was, I think was an advantage for me um, because when, when Bert, when I started, you know, doing the audition with, with him, I think he recognized like, okay, this kid has something. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, you know, off, off book. So he'd go off book and then I would follow him and then he'd go back to a line that was on the, you know, so you start ad-libbing for, I don't know, a minute or so. And I'm just going right there with him and he'd go back to the script and I was right there. And he's just like kind of wondering and then he'd, he'd do certain things like, you know, he'd slam, on, slam his hand on the table, give me the play number. And I'm just like there, not <laughs> flinching, not batting an eye. He's just like, like, who the fuck is this kid? <laughs> like, I can't, I can't lose him. I can't, you know, and I say that because other kids, like he, you know, hit his hand and then you right. know, they kind of like flinch a little bit. Like, oh, like you know, he's testing you, you're passing. Of, I'm sorry. He's testing you and you're passing at each yeah, turn. Yeah. And he's just like, I can't, I, I don't, I, this is, this is, this is crazy, you know? And so he stops the scene and he's like asking me questions and just talking to me about, you know, like my life and who I am and all this stuff. And he's, and I actually have a, a, a tape of this, but in the tape, he's talking to me and he's like going like this, telling the, the cameraman to like keep it rolling so he's talking and talking and then he goes into this other skit and i play right along so finally you know they cut and word has it that after i left he turned to the to the um the associate producer of the movie uh, her name uh, is elaine hall and, she, and he's like this is the kid like i can and so <laughs> now mind you bird had personally done i think it was 70 of those uh those screen tests and he was in between like work cause he was working on uh, the show Evening Shade at the time too. So he's just like tired. Like I'm, he's like, I don't want to audition any other kid. Like <laughs> this is who I want to do the movie with. So they're like, we have two kids that, you know, they, they flew in. Like you gotta at least see them. We can't tell them. And he, he, he literally was like, I don't want to see anybody else. And they're like, you can't do that. They, you gotta see them at least. And so he did those auditions, but he's like, yeah, this Norman is who I want to, I want to work with. <laughs> it's funny you say um, the give me the plate number thing because both me and Jason as soon as you said that we laughed because we know exactly what scene you're talking about <laughs> is how it's said <laughs> and that's another thing about the movie is yeah you're starring with Burt Reynolds but you're star you're the star yeah you're the one with all the lines me and Jason would talk we'd even like sometimes when I was at work, I would just say, what letter comes after L? And one, and if nobody say anything, I just, you know, elbow a coworker, you know, it's just one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. yeah it's, um, it's, it's amazing how, you know, a lot of the, the lines and I mean, just, well, just cop and a half in, in general, um, you know, just about a couple months ago, I was just kind of losing myself in Instagram and, you know, I, I saw my hash my name as a hashtag so i'm like hmm okay let's let's see if, you know like this this could be scary because you know there's a you know oh, people yeah. are not too kind to former child actors you know they they're kind of you know they can be kind of kind of mean and say crazy things or whatever so i'm just like well i'm curious to see what's being said about you know hashtag normally go in a second but most of the time especially when it pertains as it pertains to cop and a half i mean most people are like that movie was my shit when I was a kid and it still is because it's nostalgia and it's like this cult classic, you know? So sure enough, I'm going, you know, on down the, you know, the different Instagram posts and people are like, yeah, you know, I remember the kid, remember the movie when I was a kid, you know, God bless Norman, hope he's doing well. And then even some of those people, you know, they'll like, try, they'll follow me and they'll, you know, ask like, wow, you know, what have you been doing? Lately, you have no idea how much, you know, me and my brother or my cousin or my sister or my friend, you know, we still recite those lines mm -hmm. to this day, you know, so that's, that's always cool to, 
to hear and see. You mentioned you didn't really know Bert that that well going on. Do you think that helped your performance? You said you watched the Cosby Show. So if that would have been transplanted with Bill Cosby, do you think you would have been freaking out a little bit more? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna keep it. Yeah, I probably would be. Um, I probably would have been more aware of what I was doing, like as an actor. Mm -hmm. as opposed to just okay i don't really know who this guy is and we're just i think i mean he's cool he's a cool dude and you know we're we're doing this thing and it's just natural you right. know i i certainly think that it would have it would have probably made a difference i mean not too much because i mean i i had since then you know worked with people i mean i was obviously i was older as well so i kind of knew what you know after cop and a half i kind of knew what the business entailed in terms of okay you, you work with people that you see on tv you know this is oh and then also you're you're seen on tv so you're a celebrity so I, you know i was kind of aware of that so it, it and i never was a starstruck person so but i mean yeah i, I certainly think to, to answer your question yes it would have been you know it would have been like okay this this is this is bill cosby oh you know and i would have had to like like norman it's, it's okay just <laughs> <say hello>. <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Full disclosure, I've never seen Moby Dick. Uh but you did work with Patrick Stewart in that movie. So I'm forgive me, I don't know if, if your role was if you're similar to Cop in Half, but how how was it working with Patrick Stewart and what do you remember from that role? Um how was it working with Patrick Stewart? I wanna ask you a question. Okay. How candid can we get on this on this show man you can say it's what you want anything you want <laughs> i think maybe that might be the answer in and of itself no i don't want to disparage the man um he you know patrick stewart was patrick stewart. i mean my experience with him it wasn't all negative but it was f definitely different than burt reynolds uh you know burt reynolds is a guy that loves people he you know is he wasn't aware I, like he was, aware, like I said, he was aware of what he knew, what he had accomplished, but that didn't define how he handled people. He was a guy that just liked to have fun. He was always having fun. He loved what he did. Um, and I think that just carried over to his, just his general personality. Bert was just a people's person. Patrick Stewart, on the other hand, you know, he wasn't, and I'm, this is just my experience. And I, once again, I don't, I'm not talking negatively, right. just, just my experience. He wasn't that dude. It was just, it was more of, you know, okay, hey, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. And, and not even that, but it was interesting story. You know, we were in hair and makeup during um, the first like three weeks of production, which, which actually was rehearsals. So I just got to Australia because it was filmed in Australia. So I just got there and, you know, I was still kind of like, jet lag or whatever and we were in the trailer and um you know i'd spoken to him and it was just kind of like mm, nah. and he goes on and he's talking to you know once again totally different bird if that had been bird he'd been like hey you know how you doing oh you're in the film okay but so talking a little bit maybe not too much but just it would have been much more personable but right. so fast forward we're in the hair and makeup uh trailer and we're getting our he's getting fitted for his uh the wig that he had to wear for the Captain Ahab and you know we're sitting there and he's like so Norman you know what uh what roles have you you know what what, what have you done you know so I'm like oh you know cop and a half and you know I, I worked with Oprah there was a film I did with Oprah Winfrey uh called There Are No Children Here My Angelo was in that as well and he's just like mm -hmm. so then I, I'd say oh I did this film called Unpromised Land uh Joan Plowright couldn't even get Joan Plowright's name out and he's like, oh, Joan Plowright, I remember back in England, her and I, blah, 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 blah. So then, you know, once I mentioned Joan Plowright, it was like, oh, this kid's cool. And <laughs> his eyes, that's a legend. And Joan Plowright is a legend. Don't get me, you know, don't get it twisted. She is, a, she is up there with all of the other legends that I've worked with, you know, um, including Gregory Peck on that particular project. Uh, which, by the way, he was such, Mr. Peck was like, so much respect for that guy, same as Burt Reynolds. You know, just something to be said about, I guess you could say, that era of Hollywood, that those guys just didn't let 
Hollywood define who they were. And you could tell that, and I'm not saying that Patrick Stewart did, but it was just such a total feeling. He was probably one of the only people that I worked with that just didn't, there was no like connection there outside of, oh, okay, well you've worked with someone who I respect, so now I can talk to you. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, 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 definitely. And screw you, Patrick Stewart. Just kidding. I'll edit that. (laughs) I mean, it is what it is. Like, I mean, if I I had an opportunity to work with him again, it would just, you know, I would, you know, obviously I'd be grateful for that. But like, it it was, it was an average, you know, it wasn't anything to write home about, like, you know, working with Burt Reynolds or even Oprah or, you know, any of the other people that I named. Speaking of uh, your other co-stars, what was it like to work with Ray Sharkey? Because you guys definitely had a very cool chemistry on the screen. Yeah. um, (laughs) I don't think Ray Sharkey liked kids, but he liked me. (laughs) Well, that works for the role. (laughs) Yeah, but he didn't like kids, but I think he was like, once again, like, like who the fuck is this kid like where (laughs) did he come from he's so like serious and plugged into his work i normally i'm not supposed to like this kid but i kind of do so that was that was the chemistry i mean the chemistry that you saw between us was it was all natural it was pretty much what it what it was but ray sharkey was a (laughs) he's a very funny dude to me anyway i mean he would do stuff on the set you know especially when he had that crap you know, tossed on them, fish yep. guts and all of that. That was a really tough day for him. And, and I think- I can imagine. I, you know, I, <laughs> I heard a lot more swearing on the set <laughs> <laughs> that day when he had to do that scene. But for the most part, I, you know, once again, nothing but respect for, you know, for Ray. Um, rest in peace. You know, he's yeah. also, him, you know, him and Bert, they're, you know, they've transitioned, but yeah, I, he, he definitely, you know, in a nutshell, like I said, I don't think he liked kids, but for me, you know, he's like, all right, <laughs> <laughs> you get a pass. How was it managing uh, your school life in this new Hollywood thing? Well, it wasn't too difficult because, you know, first and foremost in my household my parents you know the ground rules were set and they were like you know you know anything under a b (laughs) you know we will give you some leeway but anything you know you got you start bringing in grades under anything under that and the acting stuff is no longer you know so i knew first and foremost i was you know a student i was still growing so hollywood was was something that would eventually would have to wait if you know the priorities weren't being met so fortunately for me you know i I happened to be a bright student and a bright kid so it you know i was able to kind of keep up with school work and still you know pursue my um my dream you know with the help of with the assistance of my and support of my parents and family as well that's i I, like i said i can't commend your parents enough it's just that's a cool story to hear it's just uh based on all your experiences with Hollywood, they all seem to be pretty positive and that doesn't always seem to be the case, you know, with child yeah. stars. And yeah. I want to ask you now that you're older, are there any instances that you look back on in your Hollywood experiences where you're like, you know what, that was kind of, that was kind of fucked up. That's kind of. Oh man. You know, I, uh, I was fortunate to really have been protected from any of those uh, that was fucked up situations. Um, I think I kind of got close to, I mean, and it could have been nothing, but you know, it, it's a situation that happened. I booked a film um, that was being shot in Northern California. And so my parents were on a business trip. And at the time, my sister who was, you know, she was, a, she was legal, legal age, she was 20. So she was, you know, she looked in on myself and my, uh, my other sister. And so it was a conflict of scheduling. The principal photography, I was supposed to report to set uh, the day before my parents returned from their business trip in Atlanta. So the agent that I had at the time, he was like, well, you know, don't worry about it. Like I can take him and, you know, and then you can just meet us 
in S Sonora is where the, sh the film was, was uh, shot. You can meet us in Sonora and then, you know, I'll fly back and that's okay. And, and my mom was like, well, can't they just wait a day and, you know, I, I'll fly in, get Norm, and even if it's the same day, you know, we can leave the same day, you know, and he was very, he's like, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll, I'll look after him, I'll, you know, I'll, I promise you. And he's like really like hell bent on, you know, like saying that he could, you know, kind of, you know, fit, fit in from a, a parents. And right. my mom was like, mm, something's not feeling right. I mean, it could be harmless, but yeah. I, no, I, 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 we can't do this. So either one of two things will happen. They'll have to wait till we get back. Or one of three things will happen. They'll have to wait till we get back. I have a daughter who's of age, she can fly with them, you know, and then I'll meet, I'll meet her in Sonora and then, she, you know, I'll take her place or they can find another kid because you're not going to fly my kid to, you know, I don't know you like that, you right. know, and mm -hmm. it's interesting because my mom, you know, she recounts this story, you know, as I've gotten older, I remember, I rem you know, I was 12 when this, all this was happening and, um, you know, and she's like, that was one of those times when you know, she really, she's glad that she listened to her gut feeling because like I said, I mean, it could have been harmless, but mm -hmm. it could have been one of those situations where that happened and then something did happen and then I'm like screwed. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's like something's mess, something's not right <laughs> from that particular, you know, experience. So yeah. I have to say all that to say in a nutshell, like I really, once again, I tip my hat to my parents because they made sure that they, you know, they protected me as much as they possibly could. And they did a fabulous job doing it. And it's not, it's not easy because you have a lot of people coming after you. Oh yeah, Mr. And Mrs. Golden, we could do this with, with Norman and blah, 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 da, 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 you know, and there's just like, well, first things first, he's our son and our job is to protect him. I mean, Hollywood can wait, you know, exactly. we don't want him to grow up at least in his formative years. We don't want him to grow up and, you know, on our watch, basically something happens and he's like, looking at us like you were supposed to protect me and right did, so even even if that agent didn't necessarily have nefarious intentions he's he's no replacement for a parent he's not gonna watch right. you near as much as your mother would or your father yeah. so yeah and it could have been it could have been you know I'm, I'm out of you know the care of anyone that's close to me my family so like you said the agent could have been fine but if it could have been someone else that's like oh well he's here with his agent. you know his parents are like oh that's you know but or whatever you know and and you know you know my mom drove home the fact that she's like i have an adult daughter who's his sibling who he trusts like what's the issue you know and so finally you know she was able to speak to production and they were like well i mean he, we just need him here for wardrobe so like honestly you know you can wait but you know, your his sister is fine. Like she's yeah, sure. <laughs> so I ended up actually, you know, flying with my sister. Um, but you're right. I mean, it, it's 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 always touch and go. But fortunately, you know, I'm I'm, you know, I have been uh, I've been protected, and I'm 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 really uh, thankful and grateful for that. <laughs> so when did you start uh, pursuing your music career? Oh, music. Music came about, let's see. Well, I'm trying to figure out how to answer this question because I've always had an interest in music. I come from a musical family. Once again, speaking of my parents, both of them are singers. Um, I have, you know, one of my sisters, she's actually, you know, a singer as well. She has a band and she performs and I mean, they're all very, very talented. Um, I don't, quite sing like that. I mean, they say I do, but I don't, I'm, my voice is just like, okay, it's whatever. Um, I'm more, you know, I'm a lyricist, MC. Mm -hmm. That's my, my speed. Um, but I've always been around music since I was, you know, even before Cop and a Half, you know, I mean, all of my uncles on my, on my mom's side, her brothers and sisters, like they all sing. Um, as a matter of fact, my grandfather, my mom's father actually cut a record back in like the, 30s or 40s and I we didn't know this until like recently before he passed you know we were sitting around and we were talking he's like yeah you know I was a fan and my group we you know we actually have a record and um we still trying to track it down but he gave us a name and we, I, we saw the group and the pictures and all that stuff and they were touring with some of the other like uh notable gospel bands uh back in the day so yeah music has been a part of my life since 
you know, birth. You know, I think that the acting thing is actually what kind of caught, you know, my overall family by surprise because there's a lot, I have a lot of cousins that are musicians and singers and rappers mm. and all of that. Um, for me, I think music came into the forefront when acting was no longer uh, a thing. You know, like I wasn't auditioning. I wasn't, you know, like really pursuing it even that much. It just kind of was like, okay, well, I've done this. Um, but I have this other talent. I have this other desire to like, you know, bring this forth. Let's see what I can do with that. And around, I think it was 2005 or so when I really got serious about like, okay, let me see what I can do with this music. 2006 I actually released uh, my first EP. Mm. Um, but it had been... A, about I would say maybe four or five years prior to that where I just you know started writing and started learning you know what it took to be an MC started studying you know some people um my brother-in-law at the time um he was actually in a rap group and you know he I would say you know he taught me pretty much a lot of what I know in terms of writing, um, and I'm, I'm going to give him his props because, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, you know, I studied like Nas. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I was like, no, my brother-in-law, who was a, he was a damn good MC, you know, who could hang with the best of them. As, actually, as a matter of fact, his group opened for uh, a bunch of acts. Biggie, wow. uh, Mace, um, I forget some of the other names right now. I mean, they, they were from uh, Illinois, so they were really big from you know where they where they're from so i mean the guy you know he had chops so i'm like i respect what you want to do and it's interestingly enough i wanted him to write me a song so that i could like record it and whatnot whatnot he's like no you can write your own song and you know i'll show you how but you know you write your own song you write songs forever you know right. being an mc being an mc means you take control of your persona your style your music you know well, Jason, you got anything for Norman before we wrap up here? Yeah, uh, I'm curious as to what your upcoming series, Hollywood Kid, is going to be about. Give us a rundown on that. Well, it's pretty much going to be about what, well, I, sh I shouldn't say what we've, what we've discussed, but it's, it's going to show, I guess you could say, you know, the, um, the transition from you know former child actor to you know what i'm doing today who i am now as a person and also you know how you mentioned something earlier about how a lot of former child actors you know you hear the stories about things that they've they've been you know kind of they've had to deal with when they were in the industry and then as they grew up they just kind of you know yeah. Lost, going crazy, and I think a lot of people attribute that to you know having fame at an early age. Whereas in my case, you know, I I don't really have those stories, and I feel like a lot of times people like myself, you know, and I'm not the only one. I mean, there's other you know former child stars who you know, and some of them have actually chosen not to pursue you know a career. Unlike me, like I still want to do you know what I love to do, but there's this like weird thing with former child actors it's almost like hollywood seemingly if you haven't like gotten a chance of you know transition into your adult acting meaning you haven't taken a break or you haven't like you know you went from a kid to doing movies as a teenager leonardo dicaprio comes to mind yeah as well. you know, he started as a child and he kind of you know he did things as a teen and then as a young adult he you know he kept his career then you're kind of isolated and put in that category of former child actor you know, and it's like, I'm, you know, I'm a whole, as you guys can see, I'm a wholesome individual. You ain't gonna find no crazy stories on, you know, <laughs> on me of doing crazy stuff. And, you know, and I, I still have, you know, I still got, I still got it. I still have my, you know, as a matter of fact, I've um, expanded on, you know, what I, what I did as an actor and I, I write, I produce, I've done all of that. So Hollywood Kid basically just explores you know, the world of a former child actor who does not have the horror stories, has seen the horror story. I mean, I've seen, you know, I've, I have friends, I've have, uh, I've seen what that, you know, what the former child star typically, you know, would look, look like, but that's not my story. So my story is a guy that's like, okay, I'm kind of like, 
I guess you could say normal, <laughs> but not really normal because I am a celebrity, but I have these, these fans that people that know me and the industry is kind of like, well, you know, you're only as good as the last thing on your resume. And if the last thing on your resume is 24 years old, then they're just kind of like, well, I mean, you got to get in line with, you know, the guy that just flew out from Denver <laughs> with $350 in his pocket to LA hoping to make it big. And I'm like, well, I don't understand how, because you know, any other industry, you've done the work that I've done. You're like, okay, you're respected. You're like, okay, I, yeah, let's bring you in. Let's do some work. So it's, it's just exploring that, that interesting uh, transition from former child star to, you know, um, I want to say adult star, but not in, not in that sense. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as, you know, being, being a you know, performer as an adult um, right. and transitioning that and not, you know, without any drama, basically. Now, that's crazy to think about, you know, that someone that's such, by the time you were 10, you had more acting experience than some people have in their whole whole careers, at least quality wise, you know, yeah. with the names that you've worked with and to just, yeah, it's just, I don't get it. Yeah. Well, who am I, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, you, uh, you, you definitely, you hit the nail on the head because once again, that's a, that's something that Hollywood kid, you know, I plan to explore, you know, with that show is like, how does an industry, you know, in Hollywood, how, how does that happen? Where, like you said, you do, you know, I've done some done work. I mean, I've worked with legends and, you know, I'm out here and, and you know, once again, I count it all joy, but I'm like, you know, I'm auditioning for commercials and I'm, you know, and it's like, there's this thing where, you know, you get to a certain point in your career where you know you don't have to audition and you're getting you know offers and all that stuff and it's like well I actually been there because a lot of people don't know my very actually the second role that I actually that's the second movie that I did the role I played um it was a movie that I did with Oprah Winfrey back in 93 called uh, there are no children here and I didn't audition for that she actually you know her well she had her people call my people basically and was like saw his performance in Cop and a Half, like the kid seems like he knows what he's doing. I wanna, you know, we wanna offer him the role of Pharaoh Rivers and there are no children here. Now, mind you, I had only done Cop and a Half. This was in 93, Cop and a Half had just came out. So granted, it was the number one movie in the country for the first couple weeks or so when it came out. So, I mean, I guess that was kind of a splash in her eyes, but I still wasn't, you know, fully tested I'd only done one film and she offered me a role in her film without having to read for the part and all of that so I say all that to say you know I've, I know what it's like to be offered roles as well you know so it is it's an interesting my story I feel is interesting in in that regard is like okay people will say well you know what happened why didn't you you had all that going for yourself as a kid like what happened so Hollywood Kid, I think, takes a, it, it, if you guys really want to know, I mean, hopefully I'm, I'm working to get it, you know, I mean, it's out as a, as a short, you know, as a short film on streaming platforms, well, it will be eventually, um, but I'm hoping to get it to a bigger project so that people can actually see, like, okay, this is what, this is what happens sometimes, <laughs> or Norman yeah. is the, the um, I guess you could say the exception to the rule, maybe. Yeah, it's definitely an angle you don't see very much, if at all, really. Rare. Yeah. Uh, well, Norman, it's been a lovely time. I think we're about ready to cut you loose here. I think we've held you hostage long enough. <laughs> and yeah, when yeah, you I'm get gonna... when you release that, make sure you can come back on, and we'll talk about it for however long you want to talk about it. Oh yeah, for sure. I would. I would definitely. I would love to do that. Um, it's one of my. You know, because I, I mean, I released a short film called Misperception, which is just a slight plug. It's on nope. uh, it's streaming on Amazon Prime now. Um, and Hollywood Kid is actually coming up. Uh, it should be released. Uh, we're working on a release of uh, 2021, January. Um, so definitely when that, when that, uh, when it releases, I, I want to come back and kind of 
dig more into you know what it's about and oh yeah you know, we're definitely going to do that uh and social medias anything websites social media um got instagram it's golden child i i uh that's my handle on that uh facebook normandy golden second i have a, a professional uh, fan page or pro page there i have a website normandygolden.com um and that is about oh twitter norman I think my Twitter is Norman Golden the Second or Norman D. Golden the Second. You type in Norman Golden the Second, you'll find me on Twitter <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, I think that's that's about it. Um, I do respond to um, fans, friends. I got a, I got a lot of friends. <laughs> fans have that have become friends. So you know, don't be a stranger. Um, it's all about you know, like I said, connecting and just people being people. So hit me up, ask questions, communicate, all that good stuff. He's telling the truth. He does respond to fans. We got him on the show. So <laughs> we can attest to that. That's been uh, another episode of Monsters, Madness, and Magic. Thank you to Norman Golden. And that's the end of that. All right, that's that. <laughs> all right, Norman, appreciate it, man. That was, that was an experience me and Jason are going to talk about for the next couple of days. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I noticed Jason a few times when I'm I'm going into like some of the the uh, explanations. He's really like listening intently. Like, wow. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you you have no clue. Like, it was I had a copy of Cop and a Half that I taped off TV with a little white label, <laughs> and ported through Whoa. the commercials. Yeah. Like watched it over and over again as a kid. I told my mom about this, and she was like, "Really?" <laughs> <laughs> like so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I I contacted you, and you know, we have we have a lot of guests. We talked to a lot of people, and uh, just in passing, I I hadn't told I didn't know anybody else had watched Cop and a Half. So I'm looking at the schedule. And I'm like, "Yeah, I got Norman Golden Cop and a Half," and I, I just said it, you know, just moving on to the next thing. And Jason was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa." Did you say cop and a half? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, you seen cop and a half? And then, yeah, that just led to a long conversation about cop and a half quotes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things, man. I mean, it's, it's, it seems like the older that movie gets, you know, people are still like, you know, I mean, I've had people, it's funny because they'll be like, yeah, I remember watching that movie as a kid. And, you know, like they have kids now who are, my age when I was in that movie, you know, and they're my age or maybe a little older. And they're like, yeah. we're showing this kid, showing this, this film to our kids and they love it. And it's just like, <laughs> kind of like that gift that keeps on giving. It's, right. it's so interesting. And that's because of you, not Bert. I'm just kidding. Uh, Bert's great. Rest in peace. But you know, like I said, you were the, you were the star of the show. And that's crazy to say it for an eight year old working with Bert Reynolds. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But we're going to let you get out of here, man. And, uh, All much right, appreciated. Man, yeah, it's been a pleasure. All right, definitely All right, have a good night now. It. All right. See you later. <laughs>